We have many of our family and friends around the world, many people in our community that are going through trials, tribulations, and in particular there is one young sister from our community who is very unwell. Let us join each other in da'a and ask for her very quick shafa'a. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 بفضلك وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين سلوات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام اللهم إني أسألك قليلا من كثير ما حاجة بإليه عظيما وغناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سحن يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفحك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيه عملي وحلمك عن كثير جلمي عندما كان من خطأي أمدي وأطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك صلوات Way to say by Imam Zamana My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh in this section of the Da'a of Iftitah, in which the awaited Saviour, Imam Al-Hajjah Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farj al-Sharif, commences this part, he starts by demonstrating his relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through a modality of mentioning the grandiosity in terms of how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can afford to a human being. Both in terms of the qualities of volume, but also demonstrating the need of the quality of the worship as well. Here the Imam states, Allahumma inni as'aluka qaleelam min kathirin ma ahajitin bi ilayhi azeema. That my Lord, Allahumma inni as'aluka, I ask you, قَلِيلًا مِنْ كَثِيرٍ مَأَحَاجَةٍ بِإِلَيْهِ عَظِيمٍ I ask you for a small amount from a very vast amount for the needs that I have. And the fact that I'm asking for this in such a manner, I recognize I am the one in need, but indeed that this is nothing to you. It is non-existent to you. When I ask and I seek from you this small amount in volume, from the vast that you have, it is nothing. In the fact, it's nothing that you can't even do without. If you give it to me, 
It's not that you can't do without it and that you are giving and by virtue your stockpile will be diminishing. But also, I recognize that for me to obtain that very same thing, it causes a titanic effort for me to put in, to try to obtain such a thing. Whereas for you, it is so simple and it is so easy for you. And then he continues. Allahumma inna afwaka an dhambi wa tajawuzaka an khati'ati wa safhaka an dhulmi wa sitraka an kabihi amali. I recognize, my Lord, that when I seek from you and I ask for forgiveness for my sins, and I ask you to overlook the evil deeds that I have done, and that you show me leniency to my, my ill conduct, I recognize the fact that you give me these things, it encourages me to seek more from you and to ask from you. Because I have the confidence that you will overlook my falls, you will overlook my weaknesses and the steps that I have taken within this world. Having said this, my Lord, I continue in the du'a. He says, I continue and I recognize that there is no Lord like you. فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَسْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِ اللَّعِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيْهِ I recognize that despite this, there is no Lord, no master like you who is able to be so generous and at the same time someone who is supposed to be so patient upon a la'im like me. A la'im in the Arabic language means a criminal, but the type of criminal who will be willing to do any sort of crime. There's no limit. There are some criminals who will say, well, I'm only a thief. I'll only go into a house and I will steal. This is the limitation of my sin. And then there'll be another criminal who will say, well, I will go and do something greater. I'll go and do murder, for example. When I am saying, فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِ اللَّعِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيْهِ I am saying that you are such a Lord. You are such a master. You are one who is so generous. You are one who is so patient upon the person who knows no boundaries in his level of sin. There's no curtailing what I do. Ya Rabbi, inna ka tad'uni fa'uwalli an wa tatahabbabu ilayya fa'atabaghadu ilayya wa tatawaddadu ilayya fala aqbalu mink. In this situation, I recognize that you are constantly calling me and I'm the one who is rejecting you. You are the one who shows me unabounding love, whilst I am the one who shows you hatred and anger. This is this section of the du'a. When the Imam speaks on these matters, there are huge, huge levels of depth that the Imam wants us to understand and to take away from this section of the du'a. Arguably, this section of the du'a is the most spiritually orientated part of the du'a. Because previously, not only am I speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a manner that begins the du'a in recognition of Him, but also I'm engaging in my loneliness. But in this particular facet of the du'a, I am engaging in another level of loneliness. I am now actually saying to my Lord that I recognize that I am so small and insignificant without you, there is nothing I am capable of doing. And indeed, despite my incapability, despite my recognition of your superiority, I continue to act in a manner that objects against you. But despite this, I know that you are the one who is going to give me. You have given me confidence in coming to you, and therefore the manner in which I seek from you is key in this discussion. We want to focus as much as possible inshallah tonight on this opening line of this du'a. Allahumma inni as'aluka qaleelam min kathirin ma'ahajatin bi ilayhi azima. Oh my Lord, when I ask, Allahumma inni as'aluka, I recognize I'm asking for something which is so small and insignificant. But yet you have that which is so vast and I am indeed desperately in need of this little bit that I am seeking from you. When I ask from you, it's nothing to you. It doesn't exist. It's not hard for you. 
it doesn't cause you any difficulty to give it to me. But indeed, if I need it, when I seek it, it is a titanic effort for me to go and get this. Whereas for you, it is so easy and simple for you. How do we understand this? When the Imam والسلام, talks about this matter of simplicity and ease and nothing, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one, of course, who says in Quran in Majid on a, number of, on a number of occasions that He only needs to say to a thing, be and it is. Kun fayakun. Of course, when we understand this, it doesn't mean literally that He has to say to something, kun fayakun. He doesn't need to say be in order for it to become. That, of course, will be a limitation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this has been put at the level of humanity so that we understand how simple a task is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there are no restraints, no restrictions upon Him. Arguably, the best explanation, tafsir of this line of du'a comes in sermon number one of Nahj al given to us by the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa in his utmost, ultimate description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He talks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no human, no calculation that can really fathom his greatness. Then he comes on to the section in which he describes the creation of this universe. He talks therein about the creation of the angels and the creation of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and all of these different sections. In one of the earliest sections, he talks about the creation of the universe. He says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, He created creation most initially. He created creation most initially. And in doing so, He didn't have to go through any reflection of the mind. He didn't have to test the waters. He didn't have to go and see whether this experiment would be correct and then alter his creation and then change it for the betterment. He created creation most initially. He did not go through any reflection of the mind. What does this mean? It means that when you assess all of creation from what we might describe as the most simple of creation, such as the amoeba, the single celled organism, up to the most loftiest and grandest of creations, whatever that might be, there was no need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test or experiment any part of that creation. Let us look at this from a scientific manner for just a minute. If I am ill, I know straight away that there are these antibodies within me that will fight whatever illness is within me. If I cut myself, the cells will already go towards the place in which I am cut in order to stop the bleeding. If I look at the most awesome of creation, if I see the intricacies of DNA, if I look at all facets of creation, be it how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the system of nature, how every single organism or how every single creature is reliant upon each other up until the top of the food chain, or how every single crea creation is embroiled, is, Im is uh, embroiled, embedded upon the system of all parts of the rest of nature, I recognize that every part of nature is constructed within itself. When I look outside and I see all of the seasons, when I see how there are turtles in their hundreds, if not thousands, that will recognize that on one day within the calendar year, they must climb upon one particular island in order to go and try and give birth to those eggs, cover them up and then return back into the sea, only to return exactly the same day the next year. But when I multiply this perfection by every single creature, I recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of this in His perfection, but without testing any of it. 
There was no pre-planning involved. There was no writing down and saying, I will make this creature do this. And by virtue, it will impact this creature. And by virtue, this will be the opportunity for this creature. It was nothing but kun fayakun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this all within his glorious nature. And it is nothing but simplicity and ease for him. Now when I say, Allahumma inni as'aluka qalila min kathilin ma'a hajitin bi ilayhi azima, I really begin to fathom his greatness. My Lord, I seek from you just a little bit from the vast amount that you have because I'm in such desperate need of it. For you it is so simple. Look at what you have created, my Lord. It didn't take for you to experiment. It didn't take for you to pre-plan. It didn't mean that you went and saw that creation was wrong and you adjusted it. All of this was so easy for you. It was nothing for you. Having then conceived Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this light, what am I really asking for? My Lord, I'm asking for a little bit. The reality is that all of this in the physical and the metaphysical domain is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole universe is easy for him. Indeed, the heavens and the hell is easy for him as well. Meaning, when I am asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a little bit from him, the reality is that for me, it is all encompassing. Because for him, it is so small and so simple. So thus, it is the entire universe. I am asking for everything and anything that is worthy of coming to me as a human being. Because the little to me is everything to him. It is so simple. It is the huge amount in existence. Now when I ask this, Allahumma inni as'aluka qalilan, I'm not asking for a little. The reality is I'm asking for a little in your eyes, not in my eyes. Because if I ask for a little in my eyes, when I look at little for me, a little is just one meal. That's a little bit for me. Or I'm asking for one simple facet of life and existence. But when I ask for a little from you, I recognize that even a little is grand by virtue of your creation. So I'm asking for everything. I am asking for all of my rizq. I am asking for all of my health. I am asking for all of my family. I am asking for all of my community. I am asking for all of my spirituality. The fact that I'm asking for a little by your standards means everything by my standards. Allahumma inni as'aluka qalilam min kathirin ma ahajitin bi ilayhi azimah. There's a Sufi saint who says a wonderful line when asking for just a little bit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, my Lord, I only want a little bit from heaven. I only want a little bit from heaven. In fact, I only want so little from heaven, I am willing to accept you allowing me to sleep on the floor of heaven. You know what, if you don't want to give me all of your palaces, and if you don't want to give me all of your gardens, and all of your flowing rivers, and proximity to you and Ahl al-Bayt, that's fine. But just give me a little bit of heaven. I am willing to even sleep on the floor of heaven. But my Lord, if you decide that I am destined for hellfire, Make me the fuel of hell in order that I may burn your enemies in hellfire. That's what I'm asking for. Just a little bit to give me completion. All I want is a little bit from this heaven. And if you do decide I'm worthy of hell, I want to be able to burn your enemies one by one. This is what it means to inculcate that asking for a little bit. It's not a little bit. It is by literal terminology a little bit. But when you knock at the door of the one who has unending, unbounding seas of generosity, there is no such thing as a little bit when you ask from him. Here, the Imam والسلام, is playing with words. The beauty is that as you know in the Arabic language, there are layers of depth to everything. The literal meaning is called the haqaiq. And then when you come to the metaphorical meaning, you come to the majazi. And therefore, when you're able to look at a word, you can look at it through both lights. Does the imam mean literally a little bit? Or does he mean metaphorically a little bit from you? Now the fact that this is a play on words, the imam is speaking in context of volume. I am seeking a little bit 
from a vast amount. The condition, the relationship is a small amount against a very large amount. This means volume based. However, the opposite of volume, the opposite of quantity is what? Quality. Instead of asking for a lot on quantity, I can be asking for a lot in regards to quality. What is the difference? In fact, if you look at the purpose of our creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states within the Holy Quran, the purpose of your creation is not quantity, it is quality within yourself. He says in the opening lines of Surah Al-Mulk, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, الَّذِي خَلَكَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ He is the one who has created us. Why has He created us? He has created death and life so that He may test us and see whom amongst us has the very best quality of action, not the quantity of action. Why did he state this? He has created death and he has created life. If you look at it from the sequential perspective, it doesn't make sense to me, does it? I don't die, then live. My first existence here is that I was born into life, then the angel of death will come and take my soul, and then I will die. Yet my Lord in order says he has created death, then life. Why? He has mentioned death first, so that you and I remember death first. He wants you and I to remember that there is a finite time within this world. I have created the concept of death. Remember your death before you remember your life. Your life is confined. Your death will bring you to the lap of an ever existing world. Remember death then life. الَّذِي خَلَكَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا I have created death and life. Why? So I may test you. To whom? To see whom amongst you is the very best in quality of actions. Not quantity, quality of actions. He wants us to see how much there is within the heart. He wants to see that when I stand in front of my Lord, I am genuinely trembling in front of Him. He wants to see when I'm reciting Quran, it penetrates the heart. It causes a difference the very next day. Here, when we understand the quality against quantity argument, it is a very simple thing to envelope it within the month of Ramadan. Imagine now the heart. The heart is called what within Arabic? It's called Qalb. Don't call it Kalb, otherwise you're calling your heart a dog. Yes? The Qalb. It is the heart. The reason why it is called qalb, the heart, because it comes from the word taqallub. Taqallub means it's rotating, it's constantly in a state, a process of going round. Meaning that the heart goes round, it goes up, it goes down. Not physically, spiritually. It's constantly in movement. Do you and I not find this? It's constantly in movement. We are already at which night in Shah Ramadan? We're at the sixth night, yes? How much has your heart moved within these six nights? There are times when you have felt tired. There are times when you have felt lazy. Maybe not you, definitely me. There are times when you've been spiritually elevated. And it comes and goes, doesn't it? There are times when you really feel spiritually energetic. There are times when you can't wait to really be conversing with your Lord, to do a little bit more ibadah, whatever it may be. This is the meaning of qalb. This is the meaning when the heart continues to rotate and go through this process of being close to Allah and a little bit further away from Allah. His idea is that when you are in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you maximize it at that particular time. For example, tonight, imagine you are leaving the masjid and you're en route home. There may be a moment when you really feel connected to Allah. Something will happen. You will see maybe the full moon. Or maybe you will see someone in front of you. Or you will remember something from Quran. Or something has happened during the day that you become grateful for. All these are sparks within the heart in order to bring you proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The idea is within the heart that as you become closer to Allah, 
you maximize that moment. You don't shut off. That means you don't go to do something else. You don't go to eat. You don't go onto the computer. You don't go and check the email. You don't go to the baraza. You don't sit with the friends. You don't have to go to the sports club at that moment. The fact that you are being called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make the most of that moment because you don't know when it's going to come round again. This is the idea of this heart being going around and this proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like that cell phone. You know, it has the bars and it shows you how much signal you have. If you're further away, if you're in a remote place, you get less signal. You're not as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when there's more signal, you take advantage. You're able to download quicker. You're able to have a better conversation. It's the same thing with the heart. When there's more signal, more proximity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't allow for a distraction to take place. You maximize that very moment. You go and do whatever the heart feels like going to do at that moment. And when the heart stops reciprocating, that is when you close the book. That is when you close the musalla. That is when you get back up and say, I will return when the heart is feeling it again. There's a way to understand this. Our fourth Imam, Imam Zain al Abidin, sallallahu alayhi wa was in his salah. And of course, the Imams, we are obliged to be, we are obliged to be wearing good clothes, clean clothes, pure clothes for our salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zayyinu Majalis, uh, He says, for example, within the Holy Quran, um, that you should adorn yourself at every place of worship. Zinatukum inda kulli masjid. Adorn yourself at every place of prayer. Meaning that when you're in prayer, you should be looking good. You should want to stand in front of that Lord in a manner that befits that salah. The Imam is wearing his cloak in salah. And the Imam, as he's in salah, however the movement was, it caused his abba to slip. It slipped down. So for example, whether he was in his takbir or he had got up from his sajda, his abba slipped down. He didn't go to pick it up. He didn't go in and put it back on himself. The companion was watching and observing this. After the Imam Salah, he came to him and said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I watched your prayer. Your abba slipped down in your Salah, but you did not go and attempt to actually put it back upon yourself. Why? He says to him, Oh my dear companion, I was in conversation with my Lord, meaning my proximity, my concentration was entirely upon Him. Had I have stopped for a moment in order to put my Abba back on, I would have been performing shirk before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine, He considers that to stop in Salah, to put back on a slipped Abba, shirk. Because I've become, or I've rather made something a partner to Allah in my concentration. I could have put it on, but had I done so, I would have stopped my proximity with Allah, what He deserves in my salah. Hence, we have the opportunity to just introspect for a second how easily distracted I, not you, how easily distracted I am with my salah. A fly comes in front of me, I want to bat it away. Someone shouts out, I get distracted. Something happened in the day, it enters into my salah. The idea is spiritually that when I am engaged with Allah in proximity, when, the, when that feeling is really there in this month, maximize it. So I learn how to practice proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, instead of just stopping it and saying, my Lord, I did feel something, I did feel close to you, but now I'm heading towards the baraza. No, when you're feeling in proximity to Allah, maximize it. It will become the training ground for you. And then when you enter into your salah, you will not have those distractions anymore. There is a wonderful, outstanding, huge line within the Holy Quran that describes this. Prophet Musa alayhi salam has been with his community, Banu Israel. He has relinquish them, help them move from the dhulm of Fir'aun. So now they are, they have exited the, 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 the split sea, and they're now in a state of freedom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now calls Prophet Musa alayhi salam 
for 30 days in order to come with him. And as we know, he makes the additional, it becomes 40 days. Musa alayhi salam is requested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leave your community, come with me. Why? Because I am now presenting to you the tablets of Torah. The verse within the Holy Quran describes this incident in the most beautiful of manners. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَى O Musa, what made you hasten from your people so quickly? وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ أَعْجَلَكَ Like we say to the Imam, Al-Ajal, Al-Ajal Quickly, hasten, hasten my master. It's the same root word. وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَى O Musa, what made you hasten from your people so quickly? The scenario here is, Musa alayhi salam is being called back to the top of the mountain in order to receive the tablets of Torah. He leaves his community and as he's running up the mountain, he's running so quickly, according to one tradition, he actually slips over upon a rock. That's not bad, it's not embarrassing. Actually, it's actually a testimony to the beautiful nature of Musa alayhi salam. He's been called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's now running towards Allah so quickly that he actually slips upon a rock. The question is, my Lord, question is, Musa, why are you running so quickly? Now here I want to make this simple relation. Think about this. Salah time, 12.35, 12.36. We know that I am supposed to leave everything I am doing in order to hasten towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah. Hayya ala khayl al-amal. How quickly do I hasten towards my Lord? How quickly do I leave what I am doing, my own people, in order to hasten towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But now I want you to think a little bit more laterally. Imagine you and I are Musa alayhi salam. It would be nice, huh? We've got a, inshallah, a good path into heaven. Imagine you and I are Musa alayhi salam. And you and I have been told the reason why I'm asking you to leave your community is because I'm going to give you Torah. It's not a small issue, is it? It's about being the recipient of divine revelation. You know that by virtue of this revelation, Millions of people around the world are going to be guided towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By virtue of this revelation, you will also have the secrets of revelation opened up to you. Now the question, revisit the question. O oh Musa, what makes you hasten from your people so quickly to the extent that you're actually going to run so fast that you trip over a stone? Maybe if I was Musa alayhi salam, I would have responded, My Lord, the reason why I'm running so fast, because I can't wait to receive Torah. I can't wait to be the recipient of divine revelation. However, Musa alayhi salam is not distracted by this. Revelation or no revelation, I care not. You're going to make me see these secrets, I care not. The response within the Holy Quran, وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِتَرْضَى The reason why I'm running so fast is one reason and one reason only, just to seek your pleasure. I'm not distracted by anything. The fact that I'm feeling this proximity to you, the fact that I'm engaged in this very moment in seeking you, I don't want anything else, my Lord. It doesn't matter to me. All these other things are just distractions. Recipient of divine revelation, give it to someone else. It doesn't matter. All I want is your pleasure and your pleasure alone. This is a huge, huge spiritual example from Prophet Musa alayhi salam to you and I. He is saying it doesn't matter about anything else. I am completely annihilated within the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't concern myself with the small distractions from within this world. There is a line of poetry from Rumi. He says, I was walking in the garden with my lover. Now here we have to understand what he means. His lover is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't mean literally. We said there is the haqa'iq, there is the literal and there is the majazi. There is the metaphorical. I am walking in the garden with my lover. The garden is dunya. 
The garden is the world. He sees this world as a place to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am walking in this garden with my lover. Distracted by a rose, my lover became angry with me and said, O oh Rumi, O oh my lover, what makes you distracted from me? Why are you looking to this rose when you have the beauty of my face here? It's imagining you're walking with your wife or if you're a sister on the other side, you're walking with your husband. As you're walking with that partner, that partner is everything to you. Nothing distracts me. One single rose does not distract me from the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, nothing in this world is supposed to distract me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I ask, I am asking for you and you alone. Allahumma inni as'aluka qaleelan min kathilin ma'a hajatin bi ilayhi azeema. What is the Imam really trying to say now in this next level of meaning? You are all encompassing. There is so much vastness of you, my Lord. I am seeking just a little bit of you and you alone. This is what I want. Allahumma inni as'aluka qaleelan min kathilin ma'a hajatin bi ilayhi azeema. All I want is a little bit of you. Give me you and I will be satisfied. There is a technique that we want to discuss, illustrate, inshallah, in order to understand the beauty of this. There's a line from the Akumail which is outstanding from the commander of the faithful. The section begins, قوي على خدمتك جوارهي واشجد على العظيمة جوانهي وهب لي الجد في خشيتك My Lord, I want you to strengthen my limbs in service of you. And the end of this section it says, What is the Imam saying in this next section of the line? My Lord, I want you to increase the dhikr that comes from my tongue. The result of which The result of this continuous dhikr is that it will enter, penetrate the heart, so it becomes a reality within me. Now what are the best lines of dhikr and how can we understand this? The very best line of dhikr according to the commander of the faithful is tahleel. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Why? The first reason is because it becomes a secret between you and Allah. There is no need for you to move your lips. Close your mouth now and say, La ilaha illallah. It is the movement of the tongue, isn't it? It's so beautiful. The beauty of reciting tawheed doesn't need to be in front of anyone. It is a secret between me and my Lord that I am praising you. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Commander of the faithful says the very best action one can do is to recite La ilaha illallah 100 times. The only thing better than this is to recite it 101 times. Meaning, continuously, more and more and more with the tahleel. The next best dhikr that one can recite is a salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. There is a hadith which says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know he started as an abd of Allah. Then he became the Nabi of Allah. Then he became the Rasul of Allah. Then he became the Khalil of Allah. And then he became the Imam before Allah. We know what he had to do to become the Imam before Allah. With his sacrifice and his knowledge of certainty. But what did he have to do to become the Khalid of Allah? What made him raise his station from the one who was going from the Rasul of Allah to the Khalid of Allah? The hadith says to us, he continuously would recite salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. This is what raised him from being Rasul to Khalid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very simple what we can do to raise our spiritual station. The hadith says that when there is a gathering, and people have been reciting the salawat upon Ahl al-Bayt at the end of the gathering, the malaika leave. The malaika leave, but upon them is the scent of the salawat. 
as they are ascending back towards the heavens, there is another group of angels who are descending from the heavens to visit another gathering where salawat are mentioned upon Ahl al-Bayt. The ones who are descending meet the ones who are ascending. They say to him, O oh, angels of Allah, what is this smell, this fragrance that we smell upon you? This is the scent that we have received from having been in a gathering when the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt recite salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. If this is what the angels are smelling, imagine internally in my soul how fragrant my soul really is. This is how we can be constantly engaged with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a final suggestion, I would like to humbly impart one action, one amal that you and I can perform in order to remain constantly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to be distracted, so that we may journey towards what Musa alayhi salam felt when he didn't even care about Torah, but only cared about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned here just now that there are certain dhikr that we can recite. Imam alayhi salatu wasalam said, وَجْعَلْ لِسَانِ بِذِكْرِكَ لَهِجَا The result of which, وَقَلْبِي بِحَبِّكَ مُتَيِّمَا We would like to present to you a very quick and small suggestion. All of you here now, inshallah, are listening to me, I hope, if you haven't gone bored yet. And here I am speaking to you. But despite us being engaged in the physical exercises of me speaking with you and you listening to me, inshallah, that doesn't mean that we can't be exercising our soul at the very same time. Just practice this. I'm going to continue talking, but I want you to pick that tahleel or any dhikr that you want. Call upon your Lord, Al Basiru, Al Sami'u, Ya Razaq, whatever tahleel. Whatever salawat, whatever dhikr you want right now, recite it. Don't let your lips move. Continue to recite it. Be engaged with your Lord. Talk to Him at the same time whilst you are listening to me. You can see that physically you are engaged with me. You can listen to the words that are coming from my mouth. But at the same time, spiritually you are able to be engaged with your Lord. Very capable of doing it. In the same way, whilst I am talking to you, it is capable for me to still be engaged with my Lord. My tongue is engaging with you, but my heart is in secret conversation with my Lord. No one knows what I am speaking about. And no one knows what you are speaking about right now either. This is a practice that we can continue to perform and evolve ourselves with. Inshallah, you're still practicing this. You haven't stopped. You haven't forgotten about it. Hopefully you're still doing this, yes? Continue to do it right now. Continue to practice it. You are listening, but at the same time you are in dhikr with your Lord. You don't need to be holding the tasbih. You don't need to be seen that you are reciting La ilaha illallah. But you are enveloping yourself in true tawheed. If for a number of years, Ibrahim والسلام, was performing a silent and secret dhikr with his Lord when he was engaged with his society, and it moved him to the point of being the Khalid of Allah, I ask you, if you continue to silently recite dhikr, where will you be at the end of the month of Ramadan when the blessings are overflowing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Continue to practice this. When you go home and you get in the car, recite it. You will be with your family. You will have your son, your daughter, your wife, your mother, your father with you. Fine. Engage with them in discussion. But continue to be whispering secret discourse with your Lord. Challenge yourself. I will whisper to my Lord for one minute. And I won't get distracted. But if I do, and I break the one minute, and I only do 15 seconds, next time I will fulfill the one minute. And then improve upon it. I will go to two minutes, and three minutes, and five minutes. And constantly I will be engaged in a secret dialogue with my Lord. My Lord, Allahumma inni as'aluka qaleelan min kathilin ma ahajatin bi ilayhi azima. I am asking for just a small amount of you from the absolute grandiosity that is you. Please raise your hands, join us in du'a. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. 
Ya Allah, allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before he is to reappear, raise us from our graves so that we can be alongside him and participate in his victory. We ask Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are in desperate need. There are trials and tribulations throughout the whole world. Ya Allah, give them victory, security and safety. We ask Ya Allah, Forgive our sins, the sins of our parents, all those whom we love, all those that love us, all of our marhumeen, all of our ulama, and all of our leaders. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to understand Quran and this month better. Help us to fulfill our fast as you have ordained for us. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them all. And we ask you, Ya Allah, in the final moments of our lives, for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May I ask you to recite one loud salawat in honor of the awaited Savior of our time, Imam al Hajj Ajjalallahu ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Oh